Welcome back to Harbour Boxed. Before we get started on this review, quick reminder that our brand new and limited edition Harbour Boxed merch is still available for the next week and a half. So get in now if you're interested and want to support our independent hardware testing. I'm pretty glad I have this hoodie because it's quite cold in my studio today. Uh, yeah, this thing is nice and warm for me. So that'll be great for getting through today's video. And what is today's video, you might ask, if I guess you didn't see the title or thumbnail. Well, we are going to be benchmarking the AMD Ryzen 7 4800H mobile APU, a bit of a follow-up to our previous coverage of the Ryzen 9 4900HS. While the 4900HS was definitely a very interesting part, it's probably not going to be as widely available as the Ryzen 7 4800H, which is targeting a more mainstream market. So today's review is going to cover what is likely going to be the most popular Ryzen H series APU among buyers. There's lots of interesting new features in AMD's Ryzen 4000 lineup, but we have lots of benchmarks to get through, so I'm not going to spend any time on them. Check our previous coverage if you're interested. And just briefly, let's take a look at the Ryzen 7 4800H's specifications and where it ends up in the product stack. In contrast to the 4900HS, the 4800H comes configured with a default 45W TDP rather than the lower 35W that AMD targets for their premium HS series SKUs. However, clock speeds are pretty similar between the 4800H and 4900HS, and in fact the 4900HS is clocked slightly higher at a 3.0GHz base and 4.3GHz boost compared to 2.9GHz and 4.2GHz for the 4800H. Cache size is the same with both models at 8MB of level 3, and of course we are getting 8 cores and 16 threads. The idea here is the 4900HS is providing similar performance to the 4800H at a lower level of power consumption, at least that's the theory which we'll be exploring in today's video. The other main difference here is the integrated GPU. The Ryzen 9 options come with a fully unlocked Vega GPU with 8 compute units and a 1750 MHz max frequency. Meanwhile, the Ryzen 7 4800H has just 7 compute units clocked at 1600 MHz. This is mildly interesting on paper, but I don't expect any H series laptops to launch without a discrete GPU pairing. The test laptop today is actually something I bought and imported from the United States. It's the ASUS Tough Gaming A15. Now, importing this thing cost me a small fortune, so <laughs> grab some merch or sign up to our Patreon page so I can afford to pay my electricity bill. Aside from the price I paid, it's actually quite good value in the United States. It's just a $1,000 US laptop, and it comes with the 4800H, 16 gigabytes of DDR4 3200 memory, and a discrete NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1660 Ti GPU at 80 watts, and there's an RTX 2060 model available as well for a little bit more. 15-inch 1080p display, fairly basic design but no obvious flaws. I think this looks like quite a suitable mid-range gaming laptop. Few quick notes on the test environment. You'll see across this video a number of different laptop CPUs in the charts and at times GPU configurations as well. The data in the charts is an average from the laptops we've tested with the given hardware, and you can check out the full list of laptops tested in the description below. Testing laptop components is naturally a bit more difficult than desktops as each configuration can vary in cooling and other hardware. So these averages are meant to illustrate how a typical system will perform. The averages do not include single channel memory systems or any other situations that heavily throttle the components at hand. We've tried our best to create apples to apples data where possible. We've also run every laptop at stock settings where possible and unless otherwise specified. So for Intel CPUs, this generally means a 45 watt long-term PL1 limit. And for AMD processors, it's 45 watts on the 4800H and 35 watts on the 4900HS and 3750H. Let's start as always with Cinebench R20. We already know Ryzen 4000 is a very strong performer in this workload. However, the 4800H does perform a little differently to the 4900HS. With a higher TDP and longer boost, the 4800H is about 2% faster in multi-thread. However, it's also about 2% slower in single core. The higher boost frequency of the 4900HS appears to make a difference here as the HS chip clocks that small amount higher in single thread workloads. Compared to Intel CPUs, it's a non-contest really. The 4800H is 47% faster than Intel's Core i7-10875H and around 67% faster than the Core i7-9750H. The only way Intel's H-series parts can get close is with power limits thrown out the window, but even at 90 watts with an 8-core Core i9-9880H, it can't match the 4800H. AMD's option is still 15% faster. 
However, Intel's latest parts do hold a single thread performance advantage, particularly over the 4800H. This APU is 3% behind the 10875H here, although it does outperform the 9750H, which doesn't clock a size the 10875H. The story doesn't change too much in the legacy Cinebench R15 test, the 4800H doesn't dominate by quite as much as it does in Cinebench R20, and actually falls behind the 4900HS here, but it still holds a considerable lead over Intel's Core i7 processors. Yes, we don't have the Core i7-10750H in these charts yet, although I just received one for testing today and I expect it to perform similarly to the 9750H, but we'll see about that in coming weeks. Handbrake is another workload that benefits significantly from AMD's faster multi-thread performance and improved efficiency. The 4800H ends up 32% faster than the Core i7-10875H here, as well as 56% ahead of the Core i7-9750H. If you plan on using your laptop for a lot of high quality video encoding or transcoding, there really is no better option on the market right now than Ryzen. In a test that takes over half an hour to complete, the 4800H also ends up 5% ahead of the 4900HS. Despite having a lower base clock, its higher TDP allows for higher clock speeds in practice. Next up we have Blender, another multi-thread workload that runs really well on Ryzen, coming in 44% ahead of the Core i7-10875H and 73% ahead of the Core i7-9750H. Like with video encoding, if you plan on doing CPU-based rendering tasks and are using an application that is heavily multi-threaded, there is no reason to choose Intel here because Ryzen is that much faster. A test that we are introducing for the first time into these videos is code compiling, in this case compiling GCC. This workload is a mixture of multi-threaded and single-threaded sections, and takes quite a while to complete. Comparing Ryzen and Intel, like the previous results, the Ryzen 7 4800H is significantly faster here, completing the task 27% faster than the i7-10875H, and 56% faster than the i7-9750H. In 7-zip compression, we see very similar performance between the 4800H and 4900HS. This means the 4800H still holds a significant advantage in decompression over Intel's processors. We're looking at a 32% performance advantage over the 10875H. However, compression isn't this Ryzen APU's strong suit, coming in 9% behind Intel's 8-core part. That said, in both circumstances, the 4800H is superior to Intel's often similarly priced Core i7-9750H. Another workload where we see equivalent performance between the 4800H and 4900HS is Microsoft Excel in a data-heavy spreadsheet. While the 4800H is 8% faster than the Core i7-9750H, it's 8% slower than the 10875H, so depending on which two laptops you're tossing up between, Intel might have an advantage. But this advantage isn't really present in PC Mark 10's lighter productivity test, where the Ryzen 7 4800H is 14% faster than the 9750H and 3% faster than the 10875H, while falling slightly behind the Ryzen 9 4900HS. The margins do shrink a bit in the Essentials test, now placing the 10875H ahead due to increased single core usage. MATLAB performance is even between the Ryzen 7 4800H and Core i7-10875H using R2020A and the built-in benchmark, while coming in nearly 10% ahead of the 9750H. This makes Ryzen a decent choice for engineers, but it's not the same overwhelming winner that it was in other heavily multi-threaded workloads. Acrobat PDF exporting is one of the hardest tests for Ryzen to perform well in, as it's fully single-threaded. The 4800H falls a significant 16% behind the 10875H here, although we're equal to the 9750H, margin of error type stuff. We've seen a few times now that pure single-thread workloads are a weakness of the 4800H that only clocks up to 4.2GHz. AES encryption performance is still strongly in favour of AMD here, although there's no real difference between the 4800H and 4900HS. Compared to Intel's processors though, you can see up to a 35% gain in this workload. In Photoshop Iris Blur, we see equivalent performance between the Ryzen 7 4800H and Ryzen 9 4900HS, so the results here are the same as we've seen previously. This means it's around 6% slower than the 10875H, but 7% faster than the 9750H. Ryzen also falls behind Intel in Puget's Photoshop benchmark, although it's important to note here that the GPU does have a minor influence in some of these tests. 
DaVinci Resolve is a benchmark that has been hotly requested, so we're adding it to this review for the first time through Puget's workload. DaVinci benefits hugely from GPU performance, and often performance is dictated more by the GPU than the CPU. So when comparing identical GPU configurations, the 4800H pulled a significant 21% ahead of the 9750H. This isn't as large of a margin as we have seen between the two processors, but given how compute heavy the app is, it's a very promising sign for those that video edit in Resolve. I think it's also worth pointing out that while the 1660 Ti in our test system is usually about 20% slower than the RTX 2070 Super Max Q in our 10875H test system, the Gigabyte Aorus 15G, our Ryzen configuration is only 12% slower. Given the Aorus system is over twice as expensive, the compute value for Resolve sides with these mid-range Ryzen systems, so long as Intel are unable to offer 8 cores around this price point. Of course, those that want outright performance will need to opt for Intel with Ryzen systems still lacking those powerful discrete graphics. And let's finish off the productivity tests with a look at Premiere. I've decided to cull our single pass encode that we normally show because recently with the 14.2.0 beta for Premiere, Adobe has introduced hardware accelerated encoding on NVIDIA and AMD GPUs. Previously, this feature was restricted to just Intel QuickSync, which was one reason to buy an Intel laptop over AMD for Premiere. Given this advantage will no longer be there in the next version of Premiere, and even today if you choose to use the beta version, it doesn't make much sense to recommend Intel for QuickSync in Premiere anymore. A brief look at Premiere 14.2.0 performance with hardware accelerated encoding on our NVIDIA discrete GPU shows the Ryzen 7 4800H performing 13% better than the Core i7-9750H in laptops with the same GPU, at least in Puget's export test, while matching the Core i7-10875H with a faster GPU. I think that's a good result, but we'll have to add more systems to this bunch to further explore the latest version of Premiere. Other tests show the Ryzen 7 4800H performing well in Premiere. For two passing codes that don't use hardware acceleration, Ryzen holds the performance crown here, which is no surprise given it outperformed Intel systems in other multi-thread workloads. Ryzen is also faster for using features like the warp stabilizer coming in 20% ahead of the 10875H and 23% ahead of the 9750H. And then for live playback of media in the timeline, the 4800H is equal to or faster than Intel's Cry 7 CPUs that we've tested in the beta version of Premiere. At this point in the review, I was hoping to include some gaming performance numbers. However, I ran into some strange anomalies with the test systems I was using, so I just want to make sure the numbers are 100% accurate before publishing them. This involves, of course, the rather tedious process of checking with OEMs just to make sure that everything is working perfectly. This video was probably going to be long enough as is when just covering the productivity performance, but rest assured we will be back with a proper investigation into Ryzen 4000 gaming when we can be sure the numbers are reflective of the real world final experience that you'll be getting as a buyer. Here are some overall comparisons between the Ryzen 7 4800H and other key CPUs it'll be competing against. First, we have the Core i7-9750H, which we expect to be close in performance to the newer Core i7-10750H. Paired with the same GPU, the 4800H was universally faster, often by pretty large margins. In long-term multi-thread tasks like Handbrake, Blender, or code compiling, the 4800H was often over 50% faster, making it the obvious choice for anyone that does these sorts of things with their laptop. But even in more GPU-heavy workloads like Premiere when properly accelerated, DaVinci Resolve or Photoshop, the 4800H still held a performance lead with the same 1660Ti in the systems. And then in lighter productivity tasks, we saw anything from marginal gains to 10% better performance or higher. Comparing these two CPUs that sit in the same price bracket, it's pretty much a domination to AMD. Comparing the 4800H to the 10875H is a slightly different story in that AMD's 4800H does not hold the single thread performance ground. It's usually around 10% slower in these sorts of workloads compared to Intel's new 8 core offering. However, the 4800H is still by far the best choice for multi thread workloads, providing 20 to 40% more performance. For encoding videos, for example, that could make a significant difference to how productive you are with your laptop. Intel struggles to compete with AMD's 45 watt offering even in a best case scenario with the Core i9-9880H running at a 90 watt power limit. The 4800H is still 5-15% to faster in long term workloads which highlights AMD's pretty significant efficiency advantage. 
And then finally, we have a look between the Ryzen 7 4800H and Ryzen 9 4900HS, a battle of 45 watts versus 35 watts. The 4900HS is quite impressive here, especially in some shorter term and single thread tests where it is marginally faster. However, long term workloads, we are still looking at the 4800H being around 5% faster. Still, Given the 29% difference in power, it's impressive that the 4900HS can offer nearly the same performance as the 4800H. And it's not like the 4800H is inefficient or anything, it's far and away better than Intel's processors, it's just the 4900HS is a step better again. My final thoughts on the Ryzen 7 4800H are quite similar to what I said in the 4900HS review, given the two parts are very similar in terms of performance. The 4800H is undoubtedly an extremely impressive APU for productivity, offering multi-thread performance that's a class above what Intel can offer, while being much more efficient at the same time. Intel's 14 nanometer process technology just isn't up to scratch for these sorts of tasks compared to what AMD and TSMC are delivering on 7 nanometer. In my 4900HS review, I did spend some time going through some of the drawbacks for AMD's 8 core compared to Intel's 8 core, including that top end single thread performance isn't quite there and there are some cache and latency limitations. That's still true when you pit the 4800H against the Core i7-10875H, but I think this comparison is almost irrelevant when you actually examine the market. That's because right now, the Ryzen 7 4800H is simply not competing with the Core i7-10875H. Laptops that use the i7-10875H started around $1,800 US dollars, while there is no Ryzen 4000 laptop on the market at all, which is priced at or above $1,800. Instead, the 4800H is squarely competing with Intel's six core offerings in the i7-9750H and i7-10750H, and we've just seen the 4800H easily beat the 9750H across the board. Of course, at some point, we could see the Ryzen 7 4800H become a premium option to take on the 10875H, and that will make the laptop market quite interesting. While each has its strengths, generally I believe you'll get the better productivity experience with Ryzen, but right now, AMD seems focused on taking on the high volume mid-range market where the 4800H is clearly a better choice, and it seems a little bit cheaper in systems with otherwise similar specifications too, so that's a resounding success in my eyes. Unfortunately, there are still question marks over just how many Ryzen 4000 options there will be in the market and how easy it will be to actually buy one. Currently, 4800H systems are in hot demand with basically everything sold out, and in the three weeks since I first looked at the 4900HS, we haven't heard about too many other systems hitting the market, either at the high end or in the mid range. I still hold out hope that OEMs are seriously evaluating these chips for their next releases. And let's be honest, I can understand some apprehension on the OEM side. The Ryzen 7 3750H was not a good laptop APU. It was significantly slower than Intel's Core i7s. So waiting to see how these new Zen 2 options perform and how they are received by the public seems reasonable. But now that we know they are good, the 4800H is more than twice as fast as the 3750H. And judging by comments everywhere, people want Ryzen laptops. So now it's over to OEMs to actually make it happen and reap the rewards. That's it for this look into the Ryzen 7 4800H. As I mentioned earlier, I'm hoping to cover gaming in a separate video soon, just ironing out a few issues there. Uh, so yeah, check back on the channel soon and we'll get into a proper apples to apples comparison between 4800H plus 1660Ti versus 9750H plus 1660Ti. And we'll hopefully add to that as well as we get more laptops in for testing over the coming weeks. Do, of course, check out as well our 10750H review that will be coming on the channel soon. So subscribe for all of that. We also have the merch available. There's about a week and a half left on that. So get in, links in the description below. And we do appreciate all the support that we get from our Patreon members who make videos like this possible. I just spent a fair bit of money to get the A15 in for testing. So thanks to all our Patreon members. Uh, you can sign up there, get all of the perks that we usually offer, Discord chat, monthly live streams, behind the scenes videos, all that sort of thing. Check it out in the description below. And I'll catch you in the next one.